So let's talk about banking now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of the problems in the world were caused by banks. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think the banking system is at now? There's obviously this massive debate going on, not only in the US, but around the world, about the regulation of banks. The Volcker Rule, which was an attempt to reimpose a sort of Glass-Steagall Act in America, right. has been, it seems, corrupted Correct. Um, by lobbying right. by the banks. Is that it now for, for um, the potential for re-regulating banks? Uh, there's certainly been some setbacks in terms of implementing the Volcker Rule or anything like uh, the old Glass-Steagall. You know, I was, the, uh, the banking system is engaged in uh, the greatest uh, institutionalized serial criminality uh, since the Mafia, since the heyday of the Mafia. It's almost as if they can't make money without breaking the law and or you're breaking some rule or regulation. Are you talking uh, about LIBOR? I'm talking about LIBOR, but, but not just that. The London whale trade, uh, which would be sort of illegal under the Volcker rule, um, uh, you know, money laundering, Iranian money laundering, um, uh, the mortgage fraud. There's just a whole, as I say, it, it's, a, it's a crime wave uh, being sort of committed by the banks. A crime uh, wave? Yeah, huh? exactly. Um, I, think we, I think you will see some very high profile arrests in the coming months. I think the, you know, the Department of Justice in the U.S. has already sort of leaked that. So you'll see some bankers led away in handcuffs, probably before the U.S. election, because it's good politics for, for President Obama. The banks have come nowhere near to providing on their balance sheets the cost of the LIBOR scandal. Uh, no, I'm not talking about the regulatory costs. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll be in the billions, but the potential civil costs from what we call class action lawsuits will be in the tens, possibly hundreds of billions. It may, may even get to the point where our Congress needs to intervene to cap the damages as they did in the asbestos litigation and the tobacco litigation. It's actually of that magnitude. So that, that, that'll take years to play out. That's not going to affect bank stocks in the next quarter or so, but that's going to be a persistent problem for the banks. But more to the point, uh, people say, you know, the Volcker rule doesn't work. It's too difficult to sort out proprietary trading from legitimate market making, kind of throw up your hands. That's nonsense. We did it in the United States for 67 years, from 1933 when Glass-Steagall was enacted to uh, 1999 when it was repealed. We knew proprietary trading when we saw it. Now see, what I don't understand is why should the burden of proof be on the government? The burden of proof should be on the banks. The government should be able to say to the banks, hey, proprietary trading is illegal. And if there's any doubt in your mind about whether you're breaking the law or not, the burden's on you. And if you cross the line, you're going to jail. If you say that, the banks will do a very good job of policing themselves if you actually enforce it. So wh why should the government be put to the task of defining the ambiguity? Why not put the banks to the task of defining the, the ambiguity and cause them to stay on the right side of the line? Well, the answer is you know, confusion, uh, uh, lack of expertise among elected officials, bank lobbying, there are all these sort of corrupt vectors moving in the other direction. But to say it can't be done is nonsense because we did it for 67 years. Well, in fact, one of the guys who was responsible for the repeal of Glass-Steagall, Sandy Wheel, who was running Citibank right. at the time, has now said it should go back, we should have Glass-Steagall back. Sure. I, look, I, uh, I believe in uh, redemption. I think if uh, Sandy Wiles is willing to say that, uh, good for him. I think he's right. Uh, they never should have repealed Glass-Steagall. By the way, he's not alone. John Reed, his co-CEO at the time, has said the same thing. A um, uh, number of uh, uh, prominent public officials have said the same thing. So this is not a uh, this is not a lonely course, but unfortunately, the sheer power of bank lobbying and bank money, uh, cor t extending corruption from the banking system into the Congress, uh, will probably mean this is not happening. We're just setting up for the next crisis. One thing you said that brought frowns to the to the faces of bankers on the panel was that derivatives should be banned. Yes. And uh, the, the counter-argument to that is, well, actual real traders and real exporters and so on need to have derivatives in order to hedge themselves. Um, uh, but you actually think that derivatives of the sort that uh, caused the crisis actually should just be banned. Sure. Uh, the, the, the conventional case in favour of derivatives is that you take a, the, the, look, there's always risk, you know, the, the risk is inherent in the banking system, there's always going to be some risk, I understand that. But the original case for derivatives is take the risk, slice it and dice it into derivatives, and parcel out the risk to strong hands, to people who were best able to bear it, who would take the other side of the trade, uh, and that would be more efficient, that would lower costs, and financing costs would be lower, isn't that wonderful? But that's not what has happened in the market. What has happened is that instead of reducing risk or sharing risk, risk has been created out of thin air on a highly leveraged basis by the multiplication of derivatives. And, and case in point, you know, when our mortgage crisis happened in 2007, a lot of analysts looked at it and said, well, there are a trillion dollars worth of subprime mortgages. Historically, default rates had never been more than about 5%. That was quite high. So they said, assume a worst case, assume a 20% default rate on a trillion dollars of mortgages, 
That's $200 billion of losses, which was entirely manageable. That wouldn't have, that wouldn't have sunk the banking system. The problem was it wasn't the a trillion dollars of mortgages. It was $6 trillion of derivatives based on the $1 trillion of mortgages that all went down together. That made it a multi-trillion dollar problem, and that did sink the banking system. So that's a very clear case of derivatives not reducing risk, but multiplying risk. And that will happen again. The derivatives, actually, you know, in, in um, uh, 2008, we, in the United States, we said one of the problems is the banks are too big to fail. Well, guess what? They're bigger today. They're more concentrated today. The derivatives books are larger. If we had a problem then, we have a bigger problem now. This will collapse again if we don't do something about it. And you also said, just finally, you said that um, uh, prosecution equals failure. If banks are too big to fail, then they're also too big to prosecute. That's right, and the banks know it. Uh, the, yeah, historically, we had a few cases of banks that became the target of criminal investigations. This goes back to the early 90s. Uh, Drexel Burnham was one, Solomon was another, E.F. Hutton, etc. And the history was that these banks failed or, or came dangerously close to failure when they became the target of criminal prosecution. So combine the two rules. On the one hand, certain banks are too big to fail. On the other hand, prosecution equals failure. So the conclusion is that you cannot prosecute banks that are too big to fail. Uh, that means they're outside the law, they're above the law, the bankers know it, they break the law, and they expect not to be punished because, after all, they're too big to fail. That's got to change. It's been great talking to you, Jim. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alan.